A few ideas that I'm presenting to you today are part of my PhD research, which strives to use effect theory in order to better understand intercultural encounter in the colonial Caribbean. Within this paper, I propose that a Spinozan under understanding of effect allows us to better comprehend different experiences of the shared material realm. I argue that Spinozan effect enables a practice that is post-human, relational, and open-ended. In order to keep to time, I'll not be able to touch upon every aspect of my somewhat aspirational abstract, but if you have any questions about its contents, I'll be happy to chat to you later. So, effect is increasingly gaining attention in archaeological discourse, as this session demonstrates. However, relatively few scholars pay attention to its philosophical roots. In this paper, I'm going to return to the work of Baruch Spinoza, a 17th century Dutch philosopher who inspired Deleuze's own work on effect. For Spinoza, effect denotes the capacity to act and to be acted upon. It's an enabling force present in all relations. The impact of this is felt more profoundly when we look at Spinoza's philosophy as a whole. I argue that the central themes inherent in Spinoza's ethics offer us a new way to investigate the past, one that emphasises difference in becoming. Consequently, I'll introduce little of his work in my talk today. To this end, I will concentrate on two concepts which are the basis of my Spinozan archaeology, imminence and assemblages of effect. I'll firstly look at how Spinoza created an ontology of imminence. In doing so, Spinoza demands a radically specific encounter with bodies without dualism. This enables us to understand difference as, a pro as productive and encourages us to focus on the emergent and relational nature of becoming. To put these ideas to work in archaeology, we must turn to the second Spinozan concept I wish to talk about today, effect. For Spinoza, effect is an enabling capacity. The final part of this paper will employ a brief case study to demonstrate how different bodies are constructed through the maintenance of certain relationships of effect in the sugar plantations of the colonial Caribbean. In particular, I'll focus on clothing, or lack thereof, and the ways in which it distinguished between social standing and informed the experiences of sugar cultivation. By considering effect in our historical and archaeological narratives, I argue that we are better positioned to consider the ways in which experience is emergent and always involves the effects of more than just human bodies. Spinoza refuses to entertain the dualism of mind over matter, and this shift is fundamental. It's the main thrust of his ethics, and represents a true break with Cartesian philosophy. Through equating God with nature, Spinoza argues that everything is part of the same substance, a university of being. There is no creator distinct from his creation, and there is no act of creation. As God differentiates in time, so things become. The impact of this shift is that we are moved away from transcendent types. In a transcendent ontology, things are compared with a transcendent ideal, a notion of the perfect type that exists outside of history. For example, in seeking to provide women with equal and comparative status to men, egalitarian feminism compares the two given entities of gender against an idea of what it is to be human. In contrast, feminisms of difference identify women as not man, thus lacking the characteristics which define man. In both instances, difference is reduced to a comparison or a negation of ideas outside of history. However, for Spinoza, there is no outside of history. God is nature, and thus for everything, being cannot be separated from the coming. In this philosophical system, the world must be thought about imminently. Every body, be that plant, animal, mountain, human, is locally situated and always in the process of becoming. A being is not defined in relation to an eternal essence, such as the ideal human. Being is defined in relation to the concrete situation which that thing finds itself. Perhaps the most influential feature of Spinoza's work for archaeology is how this philosophy of imminence requires us to have a reappraisal of the body. As Ollie mentioned earlier, Spinoza says that no one has yet determined what the body can do. He does not write this because he lacks faith in our ability to understand the body, but because he denies that there are principles which would predetermine a body's capacities. For Spinoza, a body is a synchronisation of motion and rest of different parts, running parallel to its capacity to act. Deleuze and Guattari would call this its longitude and latitude, or its extensive parts and intensive capacities. What this means practically is that bodies are made of different co-working parts which inform their ability to act in the world. This is the case for all kinds of bodies, from plants to animals to pots. This might not sound like a revelation, but it does significantly change how we see the human and more than human body. In Spinozan archaeology, the idea of an inherent natural body is done away with, and there is no fixed state of being. As archaeologists, we organise events, objects and people according to spatialised time, <coughs> and as such we alienate them from their own becoming. The absorption of time into space makes us believe that the whole is given, an inevitable illusion of spatialised time. 
Beginning with discrete objects leads us to a practice that privileges stasis over change. But things don't exist in time, they exist through time. As things differentiate, so they exist in the world. Difference is the driving force of existence. Bodies are continuous present participles. They change when they encounter other bodies and when they take other bodies into their synchronization of movement and stillness, changing their ability to act in the world. Bodies are incomplete, ongoing, and ultimately unknowable. To return to Spinoza's maxim, nobody knows what a body can do. To understand a body, then, we need to think about it as emergent, emergent, relational, and historically contingent. The question is, how can we as archaeologists approach the things we encounter with an archaeology that privileges imminence over transcendence? I propose that it's with effect that we might do so. If we return to our diagram of the body, we can see the synchronization of motion and rest of different parts running parallel to its capacity to act, its capacity to affect and to be affected. For Spinoza, effect is a force that's present in all relations, and the recursive nature of effect is crucial. As bodies come into contact with other bodies, they alter and are themselves altered. The world is made up of effects. Things are affecting and affected. It's constantly in flux, and different collections of relationships, assemblages of effect, if you will, create different capacities to act and to be acted upon. The power to affect or be affected is varied, depending on the forces involved in the relation. And I propose that as a relational approach, effect allows us to think about the dynamism of being and becoming. It encourages us to think about doings and capacities rather than fixed entities, and thus specifies us to move beyond discussions of fixed, pre-existing and individuated forms. This is an open-ended approach which begins with a flat ontology, lending itself to a productive difference. So Spinoza's importance for Deleuze and Guattari, and arguably for effect theory more broadly, is that he provides us with the tools to rethink what a body is. With the concept of imminence, it becomes clear that we cannot separate a body from the process of what Deleuze would go on to call its becoming. We cannot reduce bodies to transcendent types. An imminent ontology means that bodies must always be relational, because they are always already emerging in and through relations. These relations neither follow on from bodies nor pre-exist them, but rather emerge in parallel with them. The question is not simply how are things effective, but what relationships of effect are bodies participating in? What ways do they affect, and how are they in turn affected? I'll now turn to an example of material culture which foregrounds bodily experience, the distribution of clothing in sugar plantations in Barbados. By adding effect and opposing the transcendent ideals of what it means to be human, I argue that we're better situated to consider the contingent and emergent nature of bodily experience. In keeping with the conference theme, I'm particularly interested in the ways in which power is oriented in the relationships between people and their surroundings, and how human bodies navigated this. In a Spinozan archaeology of imminence, power is not just something that planters had to exert over different communities in different ways. It worked through different relations, between people and plants and animals, between different assemblages of effect. And Rachel highlighted that very well earlier. For Caribbeanists, the narrative of the cultivation of sugar on Barbados is a familiar one. From the mid-17th century onwards, plantation-based sugar cultivation gradually displaced the growing of tobacco, cotton, and indigo on smaller farms, with huge implications for the island demography and landscape. Monoculture flourished, landowners decreased in number, and imported labor increased dramatically. These events are generally referred to as the sugar revolution, or the sugar boom, though these are somewhat contested terms. The landscape-changing adoption of monoculture is a clear example of a dramatic renegotiation of the island's capacity to act in certain ways, and for its inhabitants, people, plants, animals, to act within it. Sugarcane, the technologies associated with it, and the demands placed upon it by 17th century planters dominated huge swathes of landscape. While the notion that all of the land was brought up by planters is now contested, deforestation and erosion on a grand scale created a significant ecological discontinuity. The growth of large plantation estates <coughs> obscured biodiversity and contributed to the mapping, naming, and making known of the island's interior. These expansive fields of sugarcane created new effects. The island had productivity inscribed on the landscape, and opportunities to leave the assemblage, increasingly striated through mapping, surveillance, and control, were limited. According to historical documents, clothing was a key area of difference in servant and slave plantation experiences. The belief that black skins and constitutions were better suited to work in direct sun for long periods was widespread in the mid-17th century and this influenced the distribution of garments. As Handler and Lang write, in the early years of the slave period, especially during the 17th and early 18th centuries, plantation slaves usually wore no more than a band of cloth around their waist to cover their pubic areas. 
In the mid 17th century, the Catholic priest, Father Antoine Biet, recorded this in Barbados, the slaves go around almost entirely naked, except on Sundays when they put on some worthless canvas breeches and shirt. The small Negroes and Negresses always go about completely naked until they're about 14 or 15 years of age. We can see the contrast between the indentured laborer and enslaved laborer clothing allocations in Richard Ligon's true and exact history of the island of Barbados. Ligon, a paternalistic slave owner whose own business failed, provides a historical account based on his own experiences of living there as a plantation manager between 1647 and 1650. Male common servants would be given annually six shirts, six pairs of drawers, and three Monmouth caps. For the female servants who worked in the fields, four smocks, three petticoats, and four caps were provided. Ligon also writes that some masters allowed indentured laborers a change of clothes once they had completed the day's toil. In contrast, over the same period, enslaved men were provided with only three pairs of canvas drawers, and enslaved women shall be allowed but two petticoats apiece yearly. Here we can see the ways in which different bodies were perceived to have different needs, and we can also see the ways in which certain gendered identities were coded through clothing. Financially, this translated into spending almost £100 on clothing for 24 servants and only £30 of, £35 of, on clothing for 100 enslaved Africans over the course of a year, a sharp distinction in terms of economic priorities and cultural difference. The difference in access to clothing would have varied plantation to plantation, but it appears we can assume that indentured labourers were generally equipped with more clothing. What effective relations can we consider here? Clothing, or absence thereof, contributed to the visual markers that coded enslaved bodies and indentured bodies differently, marking out their racialized identities. This marking was more than representational. The limited clothing accessible to enslaved laborers would have impacted them materially, particularly in the way they experienced labor in the field. What can we see when we look at this information through the lens of effect? To consider the ways in which the human bodies were affecting and affected, we must consider the environment in which people found themselves. The sugarcane played a role in people's experiences. Large tracts of land dominated by the crop created an ordered and controlled landscape where the opportunities for rest or shade seeking were limited. Hence, in conjunction with often violently enforced long working shifts, enslaved human bodies had a weakened capacity to defend against sunburn and sunstroke. Their capacity to be affected by the sun was increased with no material defense in the form of clothing. Avoiding the sun would have been considerably more difficult for enslaved peoples than for indentured peoples. While human bodies cultivated the crop, the crop affected those bodies. Pre-scorched canes could slice open bare skin, making it prey to venomous creatures and infection. And this is more, more frequent when people lacked clothing to defend themselves. A Swiss medical doctor's description of Barbados in 1661 describes the venomous creatures such as tiggers who would attack the bare feet of Barbadian inhabitants. The effects of the material realities in the field, the heat, the cane, the insects, all contributed to the violence enacted against certain bodies. Planters, with cost-cutting motivations or belief of the capacities of enslaved people's bodies to withstand extreme working conditions, forced enslaved people to work under such conditions, cyclically reinforcing the idea that less clothing was necessary. Thus, perception of what an enslaved body could do, work long hours in the sun without clothing, and like the European indentured labourers, turned into a reality. Enslaved bodies did not preclude the relations of labour and bodily violence that were enacted upon them. The condition of enslavement was not transcendent, but rather emergent. <coughs> Effects, down to the very clothes they wore, or did not wear, continually reinscribed the experience of enslavement. It was not simply the clothing allocation that informed this, but the clothing allocation in conjunction with the landscape of Barbados, the weather, the fields, the cane, the creatures, and so on. The ability to act in an enslaved body was not separable from these relationships of effect. The conditions of slavery were always emergent, and always involved the effects of more than just human bodies. Thinking of bodies in terms of Spinoza and metaphysics prompts us to consider what it is that body can do. Bodies are not reduced to static transcendent types which subsume difference, but acknowledged as open, emergent, and contextual. Here, clothing coded certain identities on sugar plantations and was a significant part of people's material realities. This prompts us to consider the exertion of power across sugar plantations. We can see that power is not a thing possessed by certain people and not others, rather it works through different relations, different assemblages of effects. By incorporating effect into our analyses, we write histories that center the human, but which also consider the impact of the more than human. We acknowledge that to understand a body, we have to consider the relationships in which it was situated, the particular ways in which it could affect and be affected. Thank you. <laughs>